The spies came back. Ten of them said, There are giants in the land. We cannot go up. There were two spies with a different spirit. They said, God's promises are true. The covenant he gave to our forefathers is still valid. The world says, We must give land for peace. We say, Christians must stand with Judea and Samaria. The world presents a biased and negative representation. It is now time for the Joshua and Caleb Report. Stories from the heartland of Israel. talked a little bit about your family how many children yes and that, that's what was right you see like? when I married my wife she was born in Tavaria her family comes from the east not from you not from the Ashkenazi there are four generations in Israel her mother's side they came from Iraq Kurdistan and from the father's side from Morocco or from Spain uh, very very special family very very humble people humble people and uh, my wife was in the army, actually. She was in the army, then she was a nurse. And uh, she got pulled away from her tradition also by the um, Israeli culture, you see. At that time, you know, being in the army, mm-hmm. they didn't have anything uh, to keep them close to Shabbat. And they so, um, you call it a baby in captivity. You know, when, when even uh, my brother is a baby in captivity. He's more than 70 years old. But, but because he doesn't... He doesn't know between his right hand or his left hand about the, 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 what we were given uh, the law of Torah. He doesn't know about these things. Huh? You see. So, what about your children? How many? How many do you, children do you? I have. have uh, I have five boys and six daughters. Wow. Um, I say I have. One of my daughters was killed in a terrorist attack. Wow. Thirteen years ago, fourteen years ago. I, I, I say I still have her as my daughter. The orphans live here. How many orphans? The, uh, her children, are, are my uh, grandchildren, are the orphans of my daughter. She was killed in a terrorist attack 13, 14 years ago in the area about uh, half an hour drive from here. They were coming back from Yerushalayim after Shabbat early in the morning and those courageous Arabs, may, maybe at 200 yards, they pressed the trigger and uh, they killed my son-in-law and my daughter at the same time. So that's, that's the reality. What was your family's reaction? You call it in, the psych- in psychology, it's like you call it a trauma, but uh, a trauma is, is close to the word tremor. The, the earth trembles and a person trembles because it's a very difficult thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone was crying. When I, I, was, I wasn't here when it happened. I was with the goats in a close, came back here. And uh, after the funeral, after um, the burial in Yerushalayim, we came back here to Puh, to Puh. Because according to our law, we have to sit seven days afterwards. Yeah. And uh, everyone was crying and I told them, I wasn't crying, I tried not to cry. And I told them, uh, stop crying. She feels no pain now. But um, the offer that was 13 years ago. I mean, the youngest girl, she was only two months old. She doesn't know her mother. Mm. Maybe some vague, vague, vague. And one, of, one of my daughters, her mother's sister, raised the orphans, you see. How many orphans? She actually even nursed the youngest girl. Oh, wow. She had a, a baby boy at the same time, so. How many children? Were left behind. I, I told you, uh, oh yeah, how many? That was six, six girls and one boy. No, five girls and one boy. Wow. The biggest boy, he's, uh, he just enlisted in the army uh, two weeks ago. I'm very happy about that. Wow. He's very good. But you see, I don't want you to be too sad because uh, I also, I mean, I, I felt a moment of a very deep sadness when I talk about it, but my realization is that orphans have a tremendous advantage over regular people in this world. Why? It's written in the Bible, in the, in the Psalms. Avi yetomim. 
the father of orphans, Hashem. It's not just a metaphor. It's true. Because I was an orphan. And my mother, when I was seven, my mother passed away. Cancer in America. And uh, losing your mother at the age of seven is like losing the world. Because you still need her. Yeah. And you know her. It's not being at the age of, of uh, one or two. It's very, very clear. But you still need her. You're not independent. So it was difficult for me. But thank God, Baruch Hashem, I, I think with that credit I came to Israel. I was given the credit of coming to Israel. That's not the shame. Because I had no Zionist upbringing. I had no religious upbringing. Why did I take that boat? So what was your response? Because there has to be some kind of response to something so tragic happening in your family. How did you, what did you do with that? I mean, when, when my wife and my son-in-law were killed. Yeah. The first thing, you have to, I use the word demonstrate. It's, it's a, like, a, like a superficial word. You have to show in a very real way to, to all your children, that's to strengthen the whole family, especially to the orphans, that you're not afraid of them. Which I, which I, I mean, my life with the flock. I'm, I'm in contact with them. I mean, I, I go near the road, with the and I sometimes I speak very uh, harshly to them. Most of the time, I speak harshly to them. But um, as an example, I, um, I, I tell them they understand Hebrew. I speak Hebrew. I don't know. I know a little Arabic, not much. I see the, the filth on the side of the roads when they go up. They go into an Arab village on the way. And they throw out of the uh, taxi or out of their cars these empty containers, Coca-Cola, like all kinds of things on the side. I see it because I walk, I don't drive. And I say to them when they're waiting there, there's a place where they wait for tramp, for the for hitchhiking. I say, how do you treat this holy land? You want this land? You're making it filthy. They never have an answer. They never have an answer to those things. So, yeah, so how do you face it? I mean, it seems like that you would have at some point faced some sort of aggression from the Arabs towards you at some time. How do you towards do me? The Arabs. Towards you. I mean, are they, have they? Do you ever have to feel like very, you have to defend yourself so. or? Very so. Really? Okay. Very so. And the only thing was this, the theft of the flocks at night. I had 400 animals. These are 30. So take, imagine more than 10 times what's here. I used to have, maybe. It was good, they were so, I can sit with you quietly. <laughs> I thought I wouldn't be able to sit more than two or three minutes. They're moving these animals, a small flock. So everything is for the best, they say, but still, I'm still looking for the animals. About four months ago, the police called me and they say, we found some of your animals in Jericho, in Yericho, in Jericho. So I went with my son and my, and my uh, grandson with the, in the middle of the night, with the, uh, these people that were here before, with the, um, um, the border police, he went into, an, in Jericho, it's very dangerous going there, so, in the middle of the night, and they went into uh, an Arab, Arab flock at night, and I identified my animals there. We put them on a truck, and we took them, in the middle of the night. Wow. But, there are, but that, that's only, uh, it's only, only 20. So I'm still looking. I have contact with uh, someone in the government, the Minister of Internal Security. It's politics, you know, they're in politics, but I try to get things moving. I'm still looking for them wow. because the Arabs usually slaughtered the animals. They were females and they, they were pregnant, you see. So they didn't slaughter them. They were pregnant, you see. They waited for them to give birth. And I still think I'm going to find most of them. Every, every morning when I pray, I mentioned this in my prayer that I should find Bazrat mm. Hashem, most of the animals healthy. And so how long ago was because, that? Because uh, it's a desecration of Hashem. When an Arab can steal from a Jew and then not being caught, I mean, they really know. They have, they can tap the telephone. They know they have telephone conversations from because they transport the animals in trucks. They took them to a certain point by foot and they put them on trucks. It was a huge flock. They have the 20 there, 50 there, 30 there. So it was a very complicated uh, movement for them. But the, the police have information. They, they say, well, listen, that's only money. Let's give him money and let the Arabs, because, um, because it's too difficult for us going to Arab villages. But I'm very, very stubborn. Very Good. stubborn. Good. 
so wow. so backing up i had one more question for you after the 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 terrorist attack on your family was there some members of your family that kind of lost heart and said i want to i want to leave this place i don't i don't have no, no 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 one no one at all even even hinted at that no really he would say this now. I said, <laughs> so what, why? L listen, it wasn't yeah. a terrorist attack. It was um, a, 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 an ambush from a distance. There was no courage in, but they were waiting for a car to pass. They were like from here to the road. There was. It was almost. It was the breaking of dawn. You see, it was light, but it was all very calculated for them. Car was gonna pass, and uh, what kind of attack? I mean, they just pressed the trigger. Yeah. It was, a, in a way, it was an attack. But still, in all, it was. Um, so, in some sense, though, I mean, naturally speaking, you want to go away from danger. It's like I want, I can't, I can't raise my family here with the with the threat of danger, the threat of something like that happening. No, you know? no. My son that remained in the Galilee, so many times said, "Come, bring the flock." I have, you have a huge Arab pasturage there. There was a, a, a spring in the middle of the field for water. Didn't have to open up our faucet. Lech, 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 lech. <laughs> so it was ideal. People ask me, well, how did you leave the village of Olives? As far as they think, come to, you have danger here. You have, it's limited, the pasturage. It was almost unlimited, the pasturage there. But the, the point I want to make, when I left the Galilee, I came by foot. Ten days by foot from the Galilee to here. And when you reach a point coming by foot, you don't want to leave so quickly. It's like the same thing coming by boat to Israel. If you come by plane, it's easy come, easy go. Get on. And the flight is very confusing. The speed, the feeling, if I tighten your seatbelts, jet lag, all that nonsense, being up in the clouds, that's not a place for human beings. And being on the sea, getting to Israel slowly in two weeks on the sea, I came to my homeland. I didn't feel like I gotta go back to Brooklyn. Wow, Brooklyn. <laughs> so the point is, there was no, no expression of, oh, it's dangerous here, let's get away. No. So what's the, um, there's gotta be more, a deeper connection to the land. I wanna know, like, what's the deep connection for you to be here with your flock? You see, when I get to the field, First of all, I know cer certain things by heart. So I Im immediately begin to say things that I know by heart. And I say it out loud. I don't scream, I, say, I hear it in my voice. And um, I know as a fact that the words I'm saying are protecting me. But I'm not depending on the words. You have to be realistic. I used to take a gun with me. I had a gun with me in the first years. But it was. It was cumbersome. It was cumbersome. It was very heavy. And uh, I used to, I used to have a machete with me, a machete, which is like a sword. But uh, I'd like to have one today. But I have a stick. <laughs> it's my stick. I got a good stick. <laughs> no, I can use the stick, and uh, so I'll show you once how you use a stick. You can kill someone with a stick. But uh, this dog has um, has been trained to attack. He's very calm. And he helps me with the flock, but he can attack someone too. Huh. But he's only at the first stages in learning this. He's very good, but uh, I have to continue. But uh, you have to take precautions. You can't be a dreamer in the field. You have to look around you. But uh, I have no fear in the field. Yeah. Especially here, I mean, <laughs> look, army camp. You got <laughs> The army, I have a few hundred soldiers over there. <laughs> so what's the difference in being here in the Galilee? Galilee, I had no problem with fear of being attacked. The Arabs in the Galilee at the time I was there, more than 30 years ago, they were like my friends. They tried to be my friends at least. They spoke Hebrew there, you see. Here they don't speak much Hebrew. But uh, uh, they used to steal a little, little bit of the animals. Not one or two, but not a whole flock. Here they steal a whole flock. But uh, you see, the Arabs in the Galilee, they're working for the Jews in the, in the, in the Moshavim, in the settlements. So here they don't work. So here you're divided, you see. Everything is clear here. In the Galilee, it's very, very undefined, you see. They can be your friend during the day. They drink some coffee on your porch, and at night they come and steal from you. 
I don't think they'll kill you in most there, but they'll steal from you. They steal so many tractors. They're stealing because they feel free. And they don't have, they're not watching in the, in the north like they watch here, you see. So if an Arab comes here, he's coming to kill usually. They came to, to steal my flock and my, uh, a few flocks, but uh, stealing a flock for them is a very, very uh, Have they not always been successful? I guess, have you stopped them before? From stealing? Have you stopped them from stealing a flock? Well, the last flock that was stolen, I was uh, near the flock in my, my son's uh, truck. I was sleeping in the truck. I had a light lit and I was reading that night. I was studying. It was very late into the night. It was like two in the morning. I was tired. And I had two dogs. He, he was a chain and then I had a, another female and she ran to the top of the mountain where I was down below and she was barking the top of the mountain. I thought to myself, probably wild dogs, a pack of wild dogs, they usually they come close. I didn't think of Arabs, but the Arabs were up there. And they waited for me to pull off the light in the, in the truck. It was about 3, 3.30 in the, in, after midnight, you see. And that's when they stole the flock. I, I was asleep, I was sound asleep. Mm -hmm. My my son tells me I was lucky because I went out, they would have killed me. He says, I don't think so. Because oh, wow. it wasn't one or two, there was a, a group of them. To do this step, they would have needed at least three, four, five, or maybe more even. It was a very complicated thing. Sure. First, they, they take them to a point in the road at night, late at night, then they have trucks, and they put them up. They have to, they have to lift a goat, you know. They mm -hmm. have to have a lot of people doing it. I can't do it in two hours, you have to do it in a few minutes. Right. So, they are professionals. In, in, in so sitting here on the side of this mountain, mm -hmm. sitting here on the side of this mountain, and breathing in the fresh air, mm -hmm. experiencing the life and what it means to be in the mountains, What's the what's the first feeling or the first thing that you want that you would say to that? Like what's like for me? I, I feel peace here. That's the first thing I felt when I walk out here. But I, I think one of the biggest things that I that I would connect to I even feel the hope for peace. Excuse me, go on. Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest thing though that I feel walking these mountains is is the history that took place here. History of the history of what took place here, like the, yeah, the yeah. biblical history. Yeah. But also, what excites me more is the things that are happening here today and what's going to happen you know so do you do you connect like the prophecies of scripture and and the and what's happening here today to anything that you feel <laughs> that's one of my um, most important projects when I read you know there's a portion you read every Shabbat a portion now we're in the last book Deuteronomy is the last book we're gonna, we're gonna and there's a, there's a holiday when you finish the reading uh, I relate things very very clearly and then there's something of the prophets you read after on Shabbat. And uh, yesterday, Shabbat, they read one verse, which I'm going to say it now. I know the verse almost by heart. I, I can show it to you, but I'll just read it without showing it to you. And uh, it's in the middle of a prophecy of Yirmiyahu, of Jeremiah. And um, before we get to this verse, there are very difficult verses, They're very warnings and then the very positive verse it says that's half of the verse what does the verse translate how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one that announces peace. And uh, I, my son, my oldest son, Shemuel, who's, we're very, we're linked so in, with, with Torah, with understanding things that other people don't understand. Just two of us. It's very rare today, a father and a son. Even a rabbi. His son is usually in another, but we're very, and um, what I say, he usually uh, understands immediately. So why is it the beauty of the feet of he? Because he's a shepherd and the shepherd walks and the walking of the shepherd on the mountains with his flock without danger, without fear, he's announcing peace. He's not hiding out in a bomb shelter in Tel Aviv waiting for those missiles to come. So he has no fear of the enemy because he's with Hashem on doing what Hashem wants him to do. You see, Cain, K 
Cain was the worker of the land and he was envious. Hevel, you say? What do you say? His brother, Hevel. How do you say it in English? Abel. 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 He was Hevel. He was able to do shepherding. Abel. <laughs> you see, he was envious because he used to sweat. And you see, Hevel, he was also worked hard, but he didn't have to sweat like him. But he, but God received the sacrifice of Abel. And Cain killed out of envy. He killed Abel. Because he was, boy, the animals disappeared. Just, uh, just about <laughs> <didn't> disappear. <laughs> <laughs> They're announcing to me now that we've got to, <laughs> I've got maybe now 10, 20 minutes. Can, can we, uh, but listen, um, you said a moment ago that um, you feel what's going on in Israel today, it's very clear to you that we're coming into a very special period of time. I don't think many Jews understand that. I don't think so. The people that study Torah, some of them, but the, the ones that the ultra-Orthodox, they look with a very, look like on the Zionist state. You know, they, they, they might be saying, okay, they're not in the Torah Karta, but they're not into it. They don't want to go into the army. You see, to protect the people and the land is the most important mitzvah, commandment at this moment in time. Even if that soldier up on the tower doesn't know what Shabbat is all about, and he doesn't have a, a yarmulke, he's doing a more important mitzvah than the greatest rabbi, because he's protecting life. He's protecting at any moment there can be on that road some crazy Arab with a knife or a gun or an explosive and he can kill 50 Jews in a bus. So that what that Arab, what the, what the, uh, what the Jew the, is learning in the, in the yeshiva, it's good. But you have to learn when you're, at, when you're in the field. I can, I'm learning when I'm in the field. I don't need a yeshiva to learn. This is my yeshiva. I, yeshiva means to sit. I sit in the field. <laughs> That's good. <laughs>